So, Kanban. Uh, this will go by pretty fast because this is a three hour presentation that I scaled down. But please mm -hmm. stop me and interrupt me. It's much more interesting if we have a discussion and talk about your problems than I clicking through all my slides. So, why should you listen to this? Well, the main reason for me is that uh, Kanban is a tool that will help you and your team to improve. And the great thing about Kanban is that you can, it can be applied right where you are today. If you're doing Scrum, if you're doing a rational unified process, if you're doing whatever, you can use Kanban today and improve from where you are right now. So that's the main big reason for me. Opening the door to Kanban will also start to peek into Lean and uh, stuff like that and you will have a world of knowledge to dig from to help you improve. A few words on me, about me. Oh my god, that was the biggest picture I ever saw. <laughs> uh, quickly, I'm Marcus. Uh, I work for a company called Aptitude. I'm a consultant uh, in Lean and Agile and doing a lot of coaching around those uh, things. I have one wife, two hobbies and three kids right now with chicken pox. Uh, I've been a developer since 1998. I actually worked in this house before. Uh, it was not uh, entertaining. Um, I'm focusing mainly on the Microsoft technology. But about eight years ago I came to a realization. I came to realize that it wasn't the speed of my typing that was the bottleneck in our process. It was something else, so I got very interested in how we work together as teams to achieve a better result, to achieve faster result. And that led me to, inter, uh, to investigate uh, agile processes such as Scrum. This is a Scrum in rugby. And uh, now uh, the last four years I've been dedicated to doing Kanban. And that leads me over to a shameless plug for a book that I'm writing right now. Uh, it will probably, hopefully, maybe have another front cover, but uh, uh, this is what it's called, Kanban in Action. So if you buy it, I get 28 copies sold, so thanks. <laughs> All right, so uh, Kanban, it's based on a very, very simple uh, principle, actually, that states that you should limit the amount of work you do at the same time. And only pull new work from a queue of work when you're done with something, so that you don't keep adding to, to uh, the amount of work you do, keeping the amount to a minimum. And doing that, you should probably take some help, and one of the helps are to visualize your workflow, to actually show what you're doing. And actually, that's pretty much Kanban. Thank you for coming all. <laughs> uh, but there's some secrets in here that we should uh, investigate further. And uh, to do that, let's check in on the Kanban principles. The actual word Kanban comes from, uh, it's Japanese, and it's actually two words, Kan meaning wishel, and Ban, sorry about the pronunciation, uh, Ban meaning card, so a wishel card. This is a Kanban card uh, used in the industry, and in the industry you have these cards to actually pull the new material to your workstation, so if you're mounting doors on a car, you have one of these attached to one door, and you pull new doors to yourself, just in time. And the guys that came up with, uh, with this is Toyota. Uh, way back actually, they started in the early 18th century. 18th? 20th? No, 1900s. Uh, and when we, when we adopted that in the Western world, uh, it was called uh, Lean. That's not entirely true. The Toyota, it's, it's called Toyota Production System, and that's not one-to-one -to -one to, with Lean, but close enough for our purposes. Uh, the inventor of uh, Toyota Production System it, is called Taishi Ono. And uh, he, uh, as you can see, it's, it's a very old uh, thing. And he said uh, two important stuff here. Uh, Toyota Production System is about just in time, and automation with a human touch, and a very strange word called autonomation. And the tool used to operate the system is Kanban. So just in time, that means that you do stuff right when it's needed, not in, in, in opposite of just in case, where you have a stock of stuff to do. So you try to minimize your stock of work and do it and get stuff sent to you just in time for your, your work to start. 
Automation, that just means that you try to automate your processes in a, ho in, in a great extent, but it's controlled by a human. Easy. And the whole idea with just-in-time is to actually create a flow of value, starting from where the customer wants something and ending when, it, when he actually gets the, th the thing that he wants. And the idea of this flow is for us to get small items moving fast through the flow. The, uh, Toyota has a vision that they will never reach called One Piece Continuous Flow. That means that when I call and say I want a Toyota, it just starts to flow through their processes and get up to my driveway in, within minutes. And that's, we're, we're far from that yet. So the thing we're trying to focus on here is to improve this flow through our process so that we don't build features that nobody needs right now if we're translating this into the software process or maybe don't write most, more specifications and putting them on, on a pile for more stuff than we can actually code right now or don't write more code than we can test right now if we're four developers and only one testers, tester that might be uh, wasting the, test, uh, the developer time and finally, don't put more, uh, write, uh, test more code than we can put in production right now. All of these are actually waste. If we write the spec specification and leave it for later, it will probably have to be rewritten anyway. So, We are focusing on getting items from start to goal in a continuous flow. And if we imagine that we have a continuous flow from start to goal, where it, where it just flows along, any problem in that flow would actually stop the flow. It would be slowed down or it would stop entirely. And that's something good. We want that, actually, because then we have a problem in our process that we can fix, and fixing it will improve the process further. So, to sum up this uh, uh, two-minute introduction to Lean, you can say that, say that Lean is actually about <coughs> focusing on flow to get value to the customer faster and finding stuff that hinders this flow and fixing it to continuously improve. And I think I hit every buzzword in the Lean Flora, flora right now. So, that, that's very good. Uh, we, we want that flow. Uh, how do we get it? Well, one thing that you focus on is what's called lead time or cycle time uh, there up by this cheesy picture. Uh, lead time is the complete process from that, the moment that I want the Toyota till, until it's actually on my driveway. And we want to focus on to minimize that lead time to uh, the, shortest amount, uh, the shortest possible time. Cycle time, on the other hand, is to focus on a part of the process. How long does it take to develop this feature? How long does it take to test this feature? In Lean, you tend to favor the lead time. How long does it take from we get an ID until it's in production? And focus on shortening that time instead. And why? Well, time is money, as you know. If we get stuff out faster, especially in your industry, I can imagine people can start using it earlier and uh, you get uh, more paid. But there's also other stuff that we'll get back to uh, that's very, <coughs> that's a, a bit more subtle that we, um, that we gain from having a fast uh, lead time, a short lead time. So let's say, I'm not sure, but let's say that you think that a short lead time is a good idea. So how, how do we get that? We could just uh, start to be sloppy, cheat, not test, for example. But that's uh, not very good, because if we do that, what happens? What happens if you don't test? The quality goes down. Yeah, and what happens then? Big yeah, customers <laughs> come back, you get bug reported, and you actually get more work to do than you started out with. So that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about getting sloppy. I'm not talking about accelerating either, because if you could go faster, you probably would have done that already, I, I hope, at least. You're not sitting and not doing... There, there's, actually, there's actually an easier way, and let's turn to mathematics. There's something called a lit the Little's Law, or sorry, Joe, he was called Joe Little, so uh, Little's Law, that's a mathematical law, that says that the more stuff we're doing at the same time, 
the longer cycle or lead time depending on what you measure let's say cycle time for now so uh, I don't understand stuff like this this is too advanced mathematics for me so let's put in some numbers and I'm sorry I didn't have time to translate my slides but I talk you through it if you don't speak Swedish so let's say that you're doing 12 <coughs> things at the same time and everything takes uh, you, you also produce 12 things per hour that's easy math right we get one hour uh, uh, cycle time for each matter. Nothing strange there for each feature we do. But if we just lower that one, we just change that number to doing six items at the, at the same time, not changing anything else, all of a sudden we get stuff out uh, at, half the, uh, at half the time, the double the speed, if you want. And uh, on the other hand, if we do 10, 24 items at the same time, the time goes up. This, there's always someone that objects about this, so let's say it uh, straight out. This, of course, has to, uh, uh, to do with how stable are your process. Can you always guarantee to deliver uh, 12 t items per hour? Maybe not, but, it, uh, but uh, over time it will actually smooth out that problem. So we want to do fewer things at the same time. So what is things that we do in uh, what what is the work in process in our uh, in our industry? Uh, let's take a short look. Well, the first thing is specifications. Specifications that we haven't written yet. That's still work in process. It's not done. Code that is not tested against other people's code. It's really hard to read, but it says it. They call me Mister. It works on my computer, guy. Uh, I've said that a lot. No, I've, I've coded, Martin I've coded, but we haven't tested it together. It's simply not done. Code that are uh, coded, checked in, but we haven't tested it yet. It still contains work to be done before it's in production. And speaking about that, code that's sitting on the shelf waiting to be pulled in production. I'm sure it's not like that here, but I've been working a lot in banking and uh, insurance company companies and they uh, they tend to favor to do production uh, take stuff to production release four times a year so e if you miss that window you have to wait three months before your stuff gets out and you cannot wait you cannot do anything about it you have to wait and it's still work in process you have there's work to be done before the customer can use your, your stuff right if we will limit if we limit the amount of stuff that we do, we, are, we get a faster flow, as I talked about. And one really good thing about that is that our feedback cycle actually is tightened. So I love the word feedback, it's one of my favorite words. And that's because feedback creates knowledge, right? If we put stuff out, we understand if people actually like what we did or not. And if we put them out, more often we get the, a tighter feedback loop and we can change stuff quicker and by changing stuff quicker we are exposing ourselves to less risk if something happens we can quickly adjust uh, and this is the reason for uh, the movement that you probably are into I presume called continuous, uh, uh, continuous delivery who heard of that? a few guys, good so that means con uh, delivering every change, maybe. So compare these two roads, because that's what happened. I draw this instead. Going back to these insurance companies. So they say, we want, we want four times a year, we want to do uh, releases. So four times a year, they do big, big releases. They have s special projects for doing these releases. And when I talked to them, I said, well, isn't that... So what happens right after this? Well, there's a lot of things that, that breaks, of course, because we had a lot of dependencies in, in here. Everybody was... And on this end of the, of the release, everybody was like, oh man, it's three months to the next release, just ship it, ship it. And they put stuff in that wasn't tested. So instead, we wanted this. Small, small changes often. And when I showed them that, they said, all right, so your system is never stable then. No. <laughs> yeah, that's right, but how big are the changes? So the reasoning seems to be, 
like the eye reason when I'm out running, which I do very seldom. So I do this big release and then I'm like, oh my god, that was very, very, very hard. I will never do that again. <laughs> when you should think uh, qu quite a, a contrary. So that was very hard. Let's do it again until it's not that hard. Uh, if you have faster feedback, you also increase your trust with the, with the person that actually uh, have uh, ordered your system or are waiting for you to deliver. So they, they know, even if you miss a date, they know that the next one is not coming up, so it's not that long until the next one comes up, so that's quite alright. So how do we go about limiting work in process then? Uh, yeah, there's an obvious thing, of course, we can do fewer things, but uh, then we'll, our customers will probably complain. So one, one thing we can do is to do smaller units of work. <coughs> Instead of doing big use cases that maybe take months to complete, we can do small user stories that we can do in a week or a couple of days. Has this ever happened to you? Not the donkey maybe, but... Uh, where, where you actually get pushed, work gets pushed to you. That what's bothering me the most about this picture is actually that if the donkey could talk, he would say something like, you know what, that last two bags, please leave them. If you put them on, I will go up in the air again and we can't move forward. So if they allow the donkey to say, well, this is enough for me, this is what I can take on, they will actually have improved the process. But they didn't, and instead they said, this is what we think that you can handle, and he went up in the air. And they didn't get anywhere. <laughs> we talked about rework. If, you do, if you're not focusing on quality, you will get stuff coming back to you, and that actually increases your working process. You get more stuff to do. That's why you hear a lot of uh, the lean gurus talk about the quality a, a lot, because you need to build that in from the start. A strong focus on quality in, in lean. Waiting time, or if you're blocked in some way, that's also something that actually creates extra work. Why? I don't know if this is a cultural thing, but I don't think so. But if, you, if you're blocked and you have nothing to do, how many in here just sits back and says, ah, I have nothing to do? You don't do that, right? What you do instead is you start something new. And then you all, all of a sudden you just increase your number, your number of work items in, uh, going on at the same time. And if you remember little slow, that means that all the work will now be slower. The more stuff you take on. There are times when you cannot move because you're blocked in some way. And then you can take a calculated risk of taking in something else. But you're paying a toll for that. And that is that all your work will now be slower than it was before. Uh, there are bottlenecks in our process, like we talked about, four developers, one tester, quite obvious bottleneck. There are ways to handle that, but that could, could also lead to people being uh, idle, being have to wait, and they start to take on even more work, and that poor tester get even more stuff in front of him. So, One way of handling this is to have cross-functional teams teams that are put together in a manner that they can actually solve all their problems within the team. So you don't have to wait, you don't have to hand the stuff over to another apartment. This, by the way, is the world's best cross-functional team ever. We have the brains here, the leader, Mr. Handsome, the muscles, and a crazy helicopter pilot that every team needs. <laughs> all right, we're going to take a look at a little movie over here. Uh, this guy, he's called uh, Mr. Hitoshi Yamada. He's a uh, follower of uh, Tai Chi On. He, he has a job now that he goes around and helps factories to become more lean. So when we when we see this, he's just jumped out of a, of a vehicle, uh, of a uh, cab or some sort, and just run into the factory that he's going to help. And uh, if your Japanese is like mine, I need to translate this for you, so. <coughs> it's coming up here. Can you show me your stuff, he said. How do you work? Look, look over here. A lot of work in process. 
作りかけの製品が大量に置かれていますワイスト、マウンティンスオワイスト。These are all work in process, and you know it's bad. What's this? Oh! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the factory manager. He's out to work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, what happens tomorrow? I have no work, and it wants to shine up. Yeah. What would happen if、uh, Mr. Hitoshi Yamada came to Net Entertainment? <laughs> How would he see all the work that you're doing? Since we don't have things that you can see the work in progress, it's very, it's very difficult to see that、right? those, those things are lying around. Excellent point, good point.、Uh, our work takes place in here, or maybe in the computer. So if you show him your inbox, that might reveal something.、Uh, but that's right, our work is not, vi not visible. And even in, in a factory where you can see stuff lying around, piles of stuff piling up in front of a slow machine, for example,、uh, they,、uh, in Lean they work a lot with visualization. That is, making information visible that wasn't before. So I went around your office, Martin gave me the five minute tour, and I saw a, a lot of boards from、uh, maybe using Scrum, I presume some of you, of you do. And this is actually an excellent technique for doing that because each note here represents some work. So if the testers have a lot of stuff to do, this, this column would be filled with stuff. And Mr. Yamada san would actually say, Oh, that's not good. You know? So, and there you have it Kanban. This is Kanban. If you don't remember anything else, remember this. This is actually an excellent site about this,、uh, also by uh, uh, a woman called Janice、uh, Linden Reed. So it's only three principles, three simple principles. The first one is actually to make work visible because otherwise we can't see it, as you said. It doesn't, it doesn't show. The second one is to limit the work in process. That's the, that is, we take up on ourselves to do, to do less stuff at the same time in order to improve the flow. And this last one holds a lot of secrets, of course, because how do you help the work to flow? Well, there's a lot of things that you can do. That's why the book is about 350 pages.、Uh, otherwise, this would be over in, in half a page.、Uh, but helping the work to flow is to focus on the shortening the lead time. How long does it take from the start to the finish of our process? And actually, A lot of agile processes already do e this. Scrum is one of those. We limit the amount of work to what we can do in two to four weeks. We focus on flow to, con to ship stuff that is done each,、uh, after each sprint. We're having、uh, boards and,、uh, and burn down charts and stuff like that to,、uh, to visualize our work. So, if a lot of agile methods are already doing this, why should I be interested in Kanban at all? Well, the first thing that is obvious, and I would say maybe the most common reason for people, people to start looking at Kanban, is that other agile methods do e s not fit very well in some places. Scrum, for example, and doing maintenance work at the same time, that's often a little crash between those two. Because in Scrum, you say, This is what we're doing on the, for the next two weeks, please don't add any more stuff. But our production server just went down. What do you want me to do? Well, you're now breaking the sprint and you get a very strange situation that you can handle in some ways, but it doesn't sit very well.、Uh, you might be very good in doing Scrum and don't、uh, feel that you have reached a plateau of knowledge and want to pu be pushed further. Then applying Kanban principles to, to your Scrum would actually help you improve your Scrum. Some of the best Scrum I've seen has actually had a lot of、uh, influence of Kanban. But that's not real Scrum. No, we don't care about that. <laughs> right? We care about delivering stuff. It's very important to call it Scrum if you're selling Scrum. And there's two guys know, that does that,、uh, that I know of, that sell Scrum in a box. We don't have to care. 
Uh, another thing that's really good about Kanban is that, that, uh, uh, that I said in the beginning, you can actually start wherever you are. So if you're not doing an Agile method today, you don't have to change anything. Just start by visualizing your work, limit the, limit the amount of work in process, and help the work to flow faster through your process. And that's really good because uh, I've been doing a lot of Agile rollouts. Oh, I don't like that word, but uh, I've been doing a lot of that, and that never works. And that's because I come with a solution. So I come and say, all right, Martin, you're Scrum Master, you two are, you are the team, and you're the product owner. Go. But I was, I was the system architect for, no, you're the product owner. And you have to change a lot of things to actually get Scrum to work properly in your organization. It's an organizational wide change. So it's a revolution. Kanban is not at, at all like that. It's just like, all right, let's put stuff on the wall, guys. Take it easy. And we min minimize the amount of work we're doing at the same time. And we see to how we can help the work to flow faster. That's all we're doing. You can still be the system architect. I'm fine, my love. You, you too? Yes. Oh. <laughs> all right. Uh, if you were really fast, you probably saw that this was Kanban in practice. And now I spent half an hour talking about uh, uh, theor theory. So let's get practical. Well, as I said, you can start where you are. So say, for example, that you have a very stereotypical uh, scrum board up there. One of the first things that you could do, which without changing much, is to actually reflect your actual workflow a bit more. Doing here, it doesn't say much what, what we're doing, right? So let's, uh, let's let, make a little more room. And now, Martin, you will see why this is 157 slides. And we'll move stuff over here. And uh, maybe we start off by thinking about what we're going to do. So let's put a column for that. And then we're doing the actual development and we'll find it afterwards we'll be doing some, some testing. So this is a very stereotypical process, of course. Uh, and don't think that I'm a waterfall guy. It doesn't have to be like this is separate, uh, separate people doing this. It's uh, the stages that our work go through. Some of them might be separate. It might be that the tester does testing only, uh, but it might also be that the developer is helping out in the tester, tester phase. So one way of handling uh, handoffs. So for the sake of argument, let's say that the, these analyzing guys, they can only do <coughs> analytics. That's the only thing they know. So that's uh, business analysts. So they want to indicate to the developers that something is ready for them to start working with. So they actually create a little sub-column here, one called doing and another one called done. So, and the developers does the same thing. So now the tester knows, all right, that one is ready for me to start working on. I can now pull it into my column and start doing work on that one. So I spent a lot of time talking about minimizing work in process and there's myriads of ways to actually come up with that, but a very common way of doing this is to write numbers above your columns. So we say, for testers, we only allow two at the same time. Two work items to be going on at the same time. Why two? I don't know, maybe it's one tester and he can only focus on two things at the same time. Or, uh, so for this team we have two in analyze, two in, uh, three in development and two in uh, testing. So if you're an agile team focusing on agile practices, you should probably have the same amount of uh, uh, items as you are people in the group, and maybe a little less than that. So if we're this, this team would actually be seven people then, or maybe eight. If you're really, really into agile and want to promote uh, cooperation, then you should have half the number of uh, people. So for a group of eight, you should have four as your total whip limit, work in process limit. Because then you will, are, you will actually promote, you will actually enforce people to work together to complete stuff. And with a low lip, whip limit like, like four, stuff will flow from here to done very quickly. If we're having a high whip limit, about 20 maybe, stuff will take longer time for, for it to flow through. Just like little slow. All right. Oh, yeah. Right now we don't have any limits here or here actually. 
I, I once worked with a team that had a whip limit on, on the down column. Do you know why? So why? were the things lying down? Yeah, they, they had actually a really good reason for that. So they said, we have a whip limit of 20 in the down column. And when we reach 20, we cannot do any more work because then we cannot pull stuff into down until the product owner comes down and treats us to a cake. <laughs> so they got a little celebration after every 20 work items. Right? Good idea. All right, you can use uh, this board to actually see problems before they happen. So here we have a, a, a situation where all the columns are full. So there's two here, three here, and two in testing. And actually the developers here, they're getting ready to move that one into to done as well. So they're running out of tasks here. So they start to ask the, the tester, can we pull another, can we push one more in here? No, you cannot. Mm -hmm. So we're out of work because we want to do that. But we cannot because we will then exceed our, our whip limit. Remember, the whip limit is something that we took up on ourselves. Nobody else has put it on us. It's our help to actually go, go faster. So when you end up in a situation like this, you should not say, that's just wrong, you can't do that. I've done that and people got very angry and walked out the room. You don't, you don't say that. This is a point where you can have an argument. All right, we said three, because that will make stuff go fast through our system. But now we want to do this, and that's not good, right? They said, what can we do to, to help this situation? Where, where is the bottleneck in this situation? Test, good point. So these are doing, these guys are doing two items and no one of them is done. So we see stuff starting to back up like this. You see that? And that, if I go backwards now, we can actually see it starting to happen already here. Hmm, this, this will not be good. Hmm, hmm. So after a while you can actually see a leading indicator. Problems will occur in the future if we don't do something about this. So what should you do? Should you do about this then? Well, I don't know. There's not, no uh, single solution to that. But maybe the de developer could spend their time helping out in testing instead of actually creating even more work. The poor tester cannot go any faster, right? Or maybe the tester is uh, divided between two projects and only do 50% in our project. Can we do something about that? Can the ana analyzing guys, can they stop analyzing for a while because we are have enough, enough, enough stuff I'm doing and help us out testing instead? So the, the important thing, as I said, is these are not rules. These are just guidelines. A bit like uh, uh, the pirate rules in uh, Pirates of the Caribbean. They are not rules, they are just guidelines. So when you run into a problem, a discussion should be had about what you should do. Maybe you should actually change the whip limit. Because the, the board is not a statical thing, it should be changed. And that's one of my uh, key tips for you, to write the, uh, always write the board on a whiteboard with a non-permanent pen. Because you should and probably will change it a lot. So here's one situation, for example. Uh, we changed the, the uh, column for done to accept. So the product owner wants to accept our our items before we push it into production. <coughs> a, reasonable, a reasonable request, I think. He cannot be with us all the time, sadly, so we create a little column for him there with items that are ready and items that he, uh, should, uh, that he has accepted. And then we create a little buffer for him because he, he w doesn't want to run down to us every fourth minute when we put something in there. Instead, we said, we call you when we have four items in there. And then you can put in a whole hour's worth of accepting and then you can push it into production. So this is an, uh, a, a queue turned over, so we have a little buffer, we buffer up works, work for him. There's a lot of function in our, functions in our industry that are like this. Maybe you have um, a, a build manager or, a dev, uh, or an operations uh, department that you, that you don't want to disturb every uh, several times a day. Instead, you maybe wait until you have 10 items and then you push all of it to, to operations. So when he gets down there, he can do all of them by himself uh, in, in a very short time. 
Another thing that could happen when you need to change the board is when a new team member arrives. Here you see the three guys uh, doing development, so they're up to their whip limit, everything is flowing along nicely, and all of a sudden, Mikaela arrives. Uh, what should we do? Well, they could try to split these work items and maybe work together on them. That's a good idea, but sadly that doesn't work right now. So let's uh, raise the whip limit down. So change it as needed. Maybe you see that it's way too harsh. If you set it too low, a lot of people will be idle because there will not be work for everyone. If you set it too high, work will be idle instead. There's stuff that nobody works on. So change it as needed. Uh, so let's see if all this visualization... What time is it? Oh, we're plenty of time. I can slow down. Again, please interrupt me if there's any questions. Uh, let's see if the board can help us to solve problems. So here we are. We have uh, one guy over here doing analytics. Mikael is doing development. And Joachim and Marcus. Joachim is my, uh, my co-author and the guy that helped. We did this presentation together. Uh, he's doing testing, Joachim. And actually, he's finishing up stuff there. So what should he do now? Any suggestions? Can you see? What should, what should you do now? Yeah, pull something from here. Yeah, that's one thing he wants to do. Or maybe he could ask him, is that important? It might be. So we might have a policy in place here that we said that we want to finish stuff as fast as possible. So that might be this team's policy. I don't know for other teams, but that might be this po team's policy. And that brushes up, up on another topic. And that is, we're, we're now, as we have stated a lot of rules here, or policies for how we work with our, uh, how our work work, if you want to, this is how we work. So we make our policies explicit. And when you see teams getting into this really a lot, they start to write out stuff like that as well. So they may be writing down here, in this column, when stuff is being worked on, we want to prioritize making it done before we do anything else. So that might be a little rule that they attach to this column above or below or somewhere. And the important thing here is to make it explicit, because that rule is already in place today, but it's not explicit. So I might have one picture of it and Martin another. So in this team they work together if possible, and it's actually possible, and they work together, and they're done. Great guys. What should they do now? Take something from the list. Yeah. So they can take something here. There's stuff to be worked on here. Great. Let's pull them. And let's finish as much work as possible at the same time, right? So we're, we're honoring the width limit of two. We're working with two items, and before long they're done. Or we might actually work on that top prioritized one. How do I know it's top prioritized? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Say. If you have a rule or that it's on the top list? Yeah, mm -hmm. that's our rule. The thing that goes on top, it's top prioritized. So the lower thing is coming, you can, it's lower prioritized. A lot of team members that I met, myself included, uh, we think, tend to say, oh, but that's more fun. I, I like that one. That's easy, so I pull that one. And yeah, you could do that, but that's actually not your decision. Because the product owner here, he has actually put them in this order for a reason, because this is the most important one for him. So by doing that, I'm actually going uh, against the prioritization of the business, if you want to. So they start working on that, and before long, they are done. Great. Let's reset the board in another manner. So it's only Marcus doing testing now. Mikaela is doing development. And you are in uh, black and white Marcus over here. We are doing uh, uh, analytics. What should I do now? I have a question. Yes. Uh, what me. if you have a PO that doesn't give you things in priority order? He just gives you a then box it of stuff. Yep. Do then it doesn't everything. matter. You can just pick anything. Then. Okay. Um, I presume. Yeah. Or you can start yeah, asking for a, a prior prioritization order. Yeah, but they never get it, so... No. Oh. Then you just pick anything, okay. right? Yeah. I, I, my suspicion is that there, there is a prioritization order, but he <coughs> probably doesn't know it either. 
So what I've done a couple of times is to... I was in a project where we had a project manager that came in every morning with a, a bunch of tasks and he went around and said, this is what you're doing, this is what you're doing, this is what you're doing. And then at, at noon he came in, you know what? Take this instead, this is more important. So he, he interrupted us a lot. Uh, and we solved that with one simple rule. So we said, all right, uh, I don't even remember his name. You know, you own this. This is product owner stuff. We own the rest of the board. This is development, developer stuff and tester stuff and analytics stuff. So you put stuff in prioritized order here. We'll do that one first. You can change this as much as you want. As long as when we start to work on one, you cannot interrupt us. That made all the difference for him. So that's what actually what he's wanted, what, what, what he wanted. He didn't want to do that, but the, the, it was his only tool, so it was not his fault. And then we went further actually and we said, you know what, Let's, can we have that one? We as a team, we own one of those spots. So when a green one goes out here, we can put in another green one over here. And that's technical stuff. So we're paying off technical debt that we know. Yeah, that's fine by me, he said. That was, it was the only thing we did. I didn't do any more Kanban with that team. If you, if you even can call it Kanban, actually. So my suspicion is, I mean, prior, prioritization, that's hard stuff often. Yeah. Uh, my suspicion is that there is a prioritization, but he doesn't know about it either. So he has to ask someone else, and that, that just gets hard. So giving him a tool like this, maybe, to, could help him. All right, back to this. What should Marcus do now? Can he test anything? Yep. How do you see that he cannot test anything? Right, yeah, you see, visualization, it's easy, nothing to test. What should he do then? Maybe he can develop. Michaela, she's sitting there all by herself, developing. But sadly, I'm no developer anymore, so I cannot help with it. I mean, there are specializations, of course. Everybody cannot do any, everything. But maybe he can help out over here, look here. A bottleneck is actually building up here, right? They're not finishing stuff and she's, she is, she, she won't have anything else to do. Can you help out in the analyze? Yeah, the tester is pretty good to have in, a, in the analytics stage actually. So you can help out there and resolve that bottleneck. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, we'll have time for this. One thing that you can continue down uh, the road of visualization is to actually show what kind of work is going on or type of work because right now it's a yellow sea of stickies right you cannot make out work from each other they are different though that one that's that's a bug and this is a maintenance thing that we have asked for for a long time upgrading the database here's a change request something that we did that they want to change and those normal yellow ones, this is a good projector, it's the first time I see the proper colors. Uh, the, those normal yellow ones, they're actually feature requests. So if we add all of that, we can actually start to see, hey, something fishy is going on here, the board is turning red, there's only bugs going on here, why? Yeah, probably. Or we can start to say stuff like, I'll skip that part later, we'll say stuff like, you know what, we want 50% of the items on the board to be features, new stuff, so we work off the backlog. The little simple <laughs> rule that I stated here was exactly that. One card on the board should be paying off technical debt. Otherwise you hit a brick wall after one. Uh, just quickly, what's on the card? Th this is a no-brainer, right? It, it's it says was what you're doing on the call, but I cannot count the number of times that I have team members uh, standing around. What well, what's this card now again? Improve performance. What's, were you doing that? What, have I done it already? Oh. They they have long discussions about what is this thing on the card. So there's two things that you can do here that I think is good. If you're working with user story, you can actually write down the user story itself. Otherwise, you could do uh, the friend. 
naming Friends naming convention, you know the TV series Friends? Every episode is called the one where Ross and Rachel get together. That's half of them, and the one where Ross and Rachel breaks up, that the other uh, half of them. So you could say, if you think, the one where, and then write the, the rest of the card down. The one where you need to create a new reporter in order to uh, supply our administ administrator with good data, or something like that. You need a good name on the, on the, uh, on the item, because it's not only you watching this board. Other people will go by and see you. You know what? I already that, did that. You can, you can borrow my code. Or maybe the stakeholder, maybe the customer comes by and says, how, how is this important stuff coming along? He can just glance at the board and see that. Uh, you have seen us using avatars like this. Uh, that's a little indicator who's working on this item. That's really good to know, right? So you can go by and ask that person. Or maybe praise him if he's doing great work. Uh, please use avatars that resembles the person in in uh, in uh, question. My good friend Joachim here, they thought they were very clever and they had dogs for their avatars. But that was just causing confusion. So is this the poodle is doing this work? Yeah. Has he talked to the schnauzer? Because that, uh, so just yes, strange stuff. You know. You could write deadlines if this should be done by a certain date. Please note it on the on the uh, item, or maybe, I mean, all information cannot go on this uh, little sticky, of course. So you can have an electronic archive. In this case, it's uh, Microsoft's Team Foundation server, uh, where you have a little errand where you collect all the items that uh, are uh, needed to understand this. Maybe there's a lot of discussions that have taken place, so you can. I see this as like, like a little uh, hyperlink. You can go there and find, find out more information. Here's a neat trick. Uh, you can start to stamp the card when it enters a column. So this uh, card entered the analytics column at that time and didn't come till development <coughs> until that time. Was that reasonable? Yeah. That's about the time it takes. All right. Well, if it wasn't reasonable, may have something to discuss. And doing this, you will actually end up collecting data that you can start to visualize and see how you're improving. If you change in something, did our lead time go up or down? Uh, other markers like this is very important and stuff like that can also go on there. Help the team members to know what to do when they see the card. You shouldn't, be able, you shouldn't have to go and ask someone, what do I need to do now? What's this about? You want to put so much information as possible on the actual sticky. And if you have room like this, you can actually add another avatar also. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, I think I'll do this and then I'll wrap up. So one of the most common questions I get when I present uh, Kanban is, how do you handle defects? If I test something here and it breaks, it doesn't work like normal. Can car travels ba travel backwards or? And really, it's up to you. You can do whatever you want, of course, it's your board. Uh, but here's three common strategies that I've seen, all with different uh, pain involved. Let's call it that, and let's see if I, you understand what I mean. So the first one, Marcus is testing something here, and he finds a bug. So one thing that he could do is to mark his little feature as blocked. He cannot work anymore on that one. And then he creates a bug card. And then he put it over here as in ready for development. So the next thing they will do is to pull that bug card. So for a while there he, can, he starts to work on another stuff, some other stuff and that's blocked and he cannot work on that anymore until the bug is resolved. Or because this team has introduced something that's very common as well. They have a, what's called an urgent lane. So if you put stuff in here, you actually take that before any other stuff on the board. So if stuff end up in our column here, we'll actually start working on that immediately. We, do, do, doesn't even, we don't even count it against the whip limit. So Marcus does the same thing. He marks his feature as blocked and he creates a bug card and he puts it in the urgent lane down there. That ensures that uh, when it, these guys will actually start to check out this, all right, so we can fix this bug right away. So he will be able to continue work on his item faster. 
So you put a little more pressure on the team here. You're increasing the pain a little bit. Uh, and the final one is that he creates a, he, he marked his features as blocked, and then he pulled the cord. Everybody get here and help me right now. This is known in the industry as stopping the line. So you can imagine people mounting doors. I've been to Scania for on a study tour. And they have actually in the floor, the, the, the lorry is rolling along as they mount stuff onto it. And in the floor they have lines like this. So if you're here, you should be mounting the door right now or you're late. If you're here, you should probably call for someone to help you. And if you're here, you should stop the line because we're in a problem now. We're having problems now. So they actually stop the line and that's super expensive. It cost, it's cost thousands of crowns per kroner per, per second. Why do they still stop the line? Because you don't want to build in a defect. Exactly. So we want to resolve it now, like these guys. Otherwise our flow gets stalled and that's, it's more important for us that the flow actually continue than we're building a stock of unfinished stuff. Mm -hmm. I heard a story about Toyota starting a new factory in, uh, in uh, the States, the first factory they started there. For the first month they stopped the line 50 times a day. And they were super happy with it. At Scania, they have a saying, love your defects. So they, they, if, they have a, if everything works like normal and they're breaking sales and everything like that, nothing happened. They say, All right, yeah, that's what we expected, right? Mm -hmm. But if something unexpected happened, like stopping the line, then they have all the, the attention needed to actually resolve why did this happen? How can we make sure that this doesn't happen again? So, all of you have now three different approaches to handling defects. You can just put them in here, or you can put them in as urgent to actually make people uh, act on it faster, or you can stop the line and make everybody run to it. And which one you, uh, you pick is up to you. How much attention you want to put, put on this. If you pick this, you will stop the line quite often if you have bugs. But after a while, people will probably start to learn. We will probably try to avoid uh, defects, right? Because it's a lot of uh, stopping and starting that we don't want. Uh, oh, yeah. I probably need to take this as well. How many are doing Scrum? Some of you. You do daily stand-ups? Good. Uh, at the Kanban daily stand-up, the focus is a bit different. In the scrum stand-up, we ask everybody, "What did you do today? What are, will you do? To, what did you do yesterday? What will you do today? And do you have any problems?" And that's fine. It's a very good practice to do that. But in Kanban, we tend to focus on the work instead. Which work is on the verge of being finished? Can we help it? So this is a board with a lot of defects in it. So let's do like Scania do and see if you can, can you find any defects here? What's strange on this board? Shout them out as you see them. The tester? What, what, what does the tester do? Uh, three. Three it's items it's and we just say two. Hmm. Yeah. Why is that? Let's talk about that. Anything else? Two, a few testers. Uh, yeah, it's, it's only one per person. Yeah, one person testing and two in the analytics there. This was someone working on something that's done. Yeah, what's he doing? He's in a parallel universe of some sort. <laughs> working on. So he needs a break, I think. Well, he <laughs> have something more coming in. Yeah, the to-do column mm -hmm. is completely empty. That's really strange. Something else? Is one person having three items? Yeah, he's harvesting stuff like a hamster over here. Mm -hmm. What's that? That's very common, actually. Mm -hmm. You know, these are related. I am better. But Yeah, yeah, but that doesn't help for whip limit, does it? So you see, I, I will stop here, but you see there's a, a lot of them uh, hiding in there. And by doing this visualization that I talked about and actually showing you some simple rules, you can actually spot this quite easy. So I have had Kanban teams with 40 people in them. And we had daily stand-up that took five minutes. Five minutes. Because the only thing that we focused on were defects. And that was simple for, uh, for um, to do since we actually had some explicit policies in place. So, like uh, you said, uh, why is it three in this column? It should only be two. Yeah, you know, and then I could just say, you know, you two work it out afterwards. 
we should have two fixes. And then maybe you say, but, but I cannot, I, we need help. All right, who do you need help for, from? And then you could do that and, and take it offline. So the focus is on the work. And what happens actually, I've seen it in almost every Kanban team, is that after this quite speedy meeting, people tend to hang around at, with, at, the, at the board. And maybe go, you know, two, that's way too hard. We never make two, it's always more than two, let's fix that. Yeah, yeah, three. So you start to have what's called in the lean industry something that's called Kaizen, continuous improvement. Let's improve our process further and further to further improve the, the flow of our, uh, uh, our, of our workflow. Five minutes to go. Uh, metrics is a big thing in, uh, in the Kanban community. Do, do you use story points? Are you familiar with story points? Story points are great because they are relative. Is this bigger than this one? That's the only thing that you get out of story points. The sad thing about story points is that they are relative. <laughs> so you, you cannot count with story points. You cannot say something like, I do it simple. You cannot say something like, this team produced 40 story points last sprint. So if I had three teams, that's 120 story points, and the back of is 240, oh yeah, we'll be done in two weeks. You cannot do that, because if you said this, we did 40 story points last sprint, you can say we did 15 for the same amount of work. So it's relative. It's what we think it is. So in the Kanban community instead, uh, focus tend to be on real data. So we might say st stuff like, uh, we did something more actually with this. We said when you put stuff in here, let us say if it's small, <laughs> medium or large. So this, this one it was large, that was medium, this was small. And the only thing we did was saying that this is large. And uh, just by doing that, we actually got a, li uh, a lot of So he, he was like, large? That's just changing a word on the page. Was that what you meant? Ah, all right, I didn't, I didn't realize that. So maybe you should rephrase it, because I thought you meant installing a new database system. And <laughs> yeah. So what you could do is say small, medium, and large, and then you can jot down the date when you put it in here and then jot down the date when you took it out. So now you have two dates. And over time you can start to have trends that say large roughly takes between 10 and 25 days in our and medium takes between uh, uh, 5 and 12 days and small takes less than 5. And not doing the other way around, that's very common. People say, let's call less than two days small. Yeah, that's not what I talk about. Small is, what do you think it is? And then we track the, the actual data, because then we start to get real data. And by doing that, you can do something really cool. And there's, there's some product uh, managers in there, right? Yeah, yeah, so you can start to do something really cool called Disneyland wait times. Uh, that's you know in in uh, amusement parks you you queue for a roller coaster and then they say when you get to this point it's 30 minutes until the ride because they have actually tracked the data so it's easy for them to say that it takes you 30 minutes so we can do that too if you put something here and it's a small it will be in production in 18 days and we can have even have some more signs when it gets here it's only 14 days left My mm, suspicion, or my experience maybe even, is that people tend to favor this over estimations. If we can actually, it, it, the, the number is not important here. If it, if it said 140 days, that would be okay as well. Because on, if I only know that it, we, that's what's going to happen. So security is much more important than the actual number, right? Which can start you thinking about what estimation is all about. Why do we do estimations? Just to feel secure, but it's still not really true. Final slides. Oh, final slides, that's good to say. Right. You don't know how many have left. Mm -hmm. So let's say that you have done all of this. Everything is working on, along nicely. And uh, you're, uh, you're, you're happy with what, what's happening right now. What happens now? Well, this is where the real work starts. Because now you have a tool 
that you can actually help yourself to improve by. At Toyota, when people are, say for example, they're mounting doors, that's all I know about cars, right? Uh, so they're mounting doors, and they work with 10 doors, so they have a whip limit of 10. Then the sensei will come by and say, how's stuff going? Well, it's good, it's all right, I have just enough to do. All right, now you're working with eight doors. So he lowers the whip limit. There's no reason for him to do that other, one, other than enforcing, making stuff go faster and thereby surfacing new problems because they will run, will run into problems. But they cannot deliver ten, more than 10 doors an hour and how should they do that? Solve that. You need to solve that in order to go faster. And that's changing the mindset in a way. So we don't say that cannot be done. We say we need to change in order to get that done. And that's continuous improvement. We need to go even faster. So we're actually, and remember that the whip limit is your tool. Lowering it as a team, you cannot set it for some other, that will give you uh, an alienated team. Uh, but lowering it and getting along as a team, that's, we're now at 10 and everything works out nice. Let's lower it to 8 and see what happens. I'll give you a little coaching tip here. Never say, let's lower it. Say, let's try an experiment for one week. You promise me that you use ex that exact sentence. And you say, Marcus said that, I say, yes, uh, <laughs> let's try an experiment for one week, lowering it to eight. All right, I, one week, we can, we, can stay, we can stand one week. And then you lower it to eight and just see if it works out. Oh, we ran into loads of problems when we ran, uh, we couldn't handle that. All right, let's go back to 10, then work on the problems and then try again. Uh, ah, I had some Kanban criticism. One of the first thing is uh, that Kanban can turn into, uh, it can turn into all work and no play. You know, there's no iterations, there's no demos and things like that. But it doesn't have to be. Put in a demo. Do work to the cake limit like that team did. After 25 uh, items, we call in the product owner and show him what we have done. After 25 items, even if we cannot show the product owner anything, we have a cake. Uh, the same goes for time boxes. Scrum is really good because it has a time box. For the next two to four weeks, we will do this and then we're done. There's nothing like that in, in Kanban, but you can put it in. This item should be done within 10 days. That's what we have promised. You can start to have a little SLA and put on this uh, healthy pressure on yourself. I said that Kanban was an evolution, but hey, sometimes maybe you need a revolution to shake st stuff up. So maybe go with something else. This is an important slide. Kanban can turn into being very sloppy. It's like, all right, Kanban, I love Kanban. That's just three rules. You don't have to do anything. No sprint planning, no retrospective, no demos, and nothing. Don't do that. You will end up in, in problems and, and pr people will just stop using the process. The most common problem I see is people drawing the process like that and they say, you know what, we start without any whip limits. Don't do, we don't do whip limits right now, we do them later. That means that anything is allowed. So you can have a, a loads of stuff going on here at the same time. What, what happens with loads of stuff going on at the same time? Everything goes very slow. But it could be good just to show what's going on, just to visualize. Yes, so, but I say put in a whip limit, in, not a low one. So the first thing I do is I take a look at the board and then we see... All right, so we have 13 items going on here at the same time. How do you want to distribute those 13 points? Yeah, so we have three here, three here, three here, and uh, four here. Good, that's our starting point. So you don't, have, you don't want to, that, that's a valid point, you don't want to turn the pressure up too early, right? Because then it will just be pain. But then after a while you can say, you think we can speed this up a bit? Let's, let's start with uh, setting this to two and see what happens. So here's my call to arms. You can start tomorrow actually, or right now if you want to. The first thing you can agree on is not to start new stuff until something else is done. Stop starting, start finishing. 
if you haven't already, please visualize your workflow. That will teach you a lot, just as you said. Just putting stuff up on the wall, that's a big aha thing for many teams. Start by limiting the whip. And limiting whip is not saying have a very low whip. That's the end goal, but Toyota is not there yet. They have been working on it with this for 50 years. So set a whip limit and don't increase it unless you have a discussion about why. Monitor the flow, see what, how, what you can do to actually improve the flow, to make stuff go from ID to customer even faster. And start tracking metrics to help you improve, so you know what you're doing. There's uh, sites, a site called Limited Whip Society where, where you can learn more about this. So Martin and I had a deal actually, I think it was with you and I? Yeah. yeah. We had a deal. So I said, uh, as I said in the beginning, I, I, I do this presentation for free because otherwise I get bored uh, during these two weeks. So Martin called me and said, uh, and, and we decided to, sh uh, to uh, give to charity what I usually take for a presentation like this. The only problem is that I, I do a lot of presentations that could be called sales. And then I do other presentations that are really expensive because we want to charge the customer for, for this and it's, uh, they maybe invite customers and things like that. So it's hard for me to say what I, uh, what I actually take for something like that. So I said, all right, pay 500 kron. That's cheap, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So, and then after the presentation, we do a fist of five. So you get to vote on how good you think it, this was. And we'll do it like this. Return on time invested. You're all very busy people. I am now taking up an hour of your time. Uh, so please put a little X on this axis, where this is the worst time in your life. <laughs> this is, if I was in heaven, I would be beamed back into this hall and actually hear this presentation instead. And for, for, every, for every number that I get, uh, Martin will uh, give a thousand kroner to charity. Not personally, I think, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You see? So if I score 4.8, that uh, will be 4,800 4, kroners for, to share it. Plus 500. Plus 500, yeah, yeah that's yeah. right. That was my base yeah. fee. So, I, and I don't get any of that. So it's for charity. All of it. Thank you so much for your time. I will be hanging around here if you have any questions. Can you show the last slide? Oh, yeah. Can I take a picture of it? Yeah. Uh, I can actually send the slides to Martin and he'll distribute it to you. Yeah. You want that? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank, Thank you. you.